So we have an all-star panel right here. These are some of the most successful people in cryptocurrency. I'm hoping that I might learn something about how they got where they are. and They obviously have a lot to teach there. So uh, right here, we've got Dan Moorhead. He's the CEO and founder of Pantera Capital. Mike Novogratz, who's the CEO of Galaxy Digital. And Joseph Lubin, who's the founder and CEO of Consensus. Now, one interesting fact that I actually only just uh, learned a few minutes minutes earlier, you guys were all in the same class at college. You were in the class of 87 at Princeton. Like, is there something, was there something in the water there? Like, what magic happened that uh, led you all to this stage right now? Anything? I mean, well, my... Well, Jeff Bezos was the class of 86, and he kind of stole the internet. Yeah, exactly. So. And so we figured we, crypto was we, the next We best can't thing. even compete. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, it, I was wondering, like, did you guys take any classes that got you interested in this sort of thing? Did you have any idea that you would end up working in the cryptocurrency space? I mean, eGold didn't come around until 1996, so that's not another nine years uh, yeah, the, to that The happened. space is the intersection of computer science and economics, and so we represent that. Uh, I, I'm on the computer science side. I think that's awesome. Uh, so cool little little fact there. So let's just start off uh, talking about you know how you guys got involved in all of this. And uh, I mean, there's some sort of prescience there for people to get involved early in the industry and really know what was going to happen. You've all been incredibly successful at that. So um, I'd love to know you know how you saw this crypto revolution coming. Let's start with you, Dan. So you actually founded Pantera Capital in 2003, but then in 2013 you pivoted and just became cryptocurrency only. What led you to make that decision of just going all in on crypto? Yeah, so my, uh, my brother introduced me to Bitcoin in 2011 when Gavin Andreessen, who's another guy that was at college with us at the time, had this thing called a Bitcoin faucet. You get free Bitcoins just for logging in. That just shows how much the world's changed. Uh, and I read about it and I thought, oh, this would be amazing if Bitcoin actually happened, be so great for the world, but then kind of didn't really do anything professionally about it. Uh, and then Mike called uh, with his partner, Pete Brigger, and asked if I could come in for a coffee so we could talk about Bitcoin. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I read a bunch about it and cool. And I went in for coffee and didn't leave for like three months. I stayed in their office and I was like, this thing is just so big. Uh, and then decided about four or five months later when Bitcoin kind of got to a trough just to go all in. That's a, a giant leap there. I, I'm glad you're here. You've done a tremendous amount of, of work to build up this space. That's something all of you have done. I'm looking at the uh, mission statements on all of your companies. All of them say we want to promote cryptocurrency in the ecosystem. Um, so I'd love to know whether you guys think you've been successful at that. Let's, uh, let's go to you, Mike. So you were formerly you were uh, a partner at Goldman Sachs. You were an ex-hedge fund manager. You decided to go all in to uh, uh, your new company, which which is crypto-focused, uh, Galaxy Digital. So what made you make that shift? So I've been a macro investor. So macro investors try to understand what the future looks like. We look at the big trends, if it's economic data or social data. Um, and when my friend asked me to look into Bitcoin, I looked in, there were lots of reasons that I thought it could be a bubble. And so I remember calling Dan and Dan did a whole lot of work and called back. He said, this is really going to change the world. And it played so much into the hands of a macro trader, right? Especially the, the, the first few years of it, right? It was a, a big story, right? Crypto was a big story. It was a middle finger to the man, right? It was let's get, take trust back away from institutions and, and distribute it to the people. It was the democratization of finance. Uh, it, it all kind of got blended together. And so it completely played into my strengths as an investor. Uh, you know, it's funny, I sit between two guys that helped me make tons of money because I don't think I would have made nearly as much money in crypto if Dan didn't go so much all in. So I had to go at least as much as he did. And so that was my Bitcoin bet. And then Joe called me from, or texted me from a Caribbean island and he'd been working on the Ethereum project. And I remember after I had left Fortress walking into Joe's office, you know, having heard about Ethereum, but they had just done their, their, their launch a few months earlier. It was trading around a dollar, uh, and you know, I'd already had the big run in Bitcoin, and uh, it gone up and come back down. And there was so much energy in his office that, that I realized this was more than just a speculative asset. You know, they were literally plotting out how to disrupt multiple industries with a real revolutionary zeal. 
And so then I was like, ah, there's something more to this. And then I kind of went all in on Ethereum and in Bitcoin. Uh, and I tell people all the time, if you, why I tell people to put something on the table, to put a chip on, because when you start making money in something, it becomes far more interesting to you. And so as it became more interesting, I dug and dug and dug and finally decided this was, that I had something to add to the community, that I had a role to play. And so I started Galaxy Digital and we're trying to play our role. Awesome. And Joseph, so uh, you are the centerpiece for Consensus, which is like the centerpiece for the Ethereum community. I mean, Consensus is responsible for so much of the innovation we see on the Ethereum blockchain, all the really cool companies that come out of there. Consensus, you know, does a lot to promote that. So tell me why you decided to get into crypto in general, but then focus specifically on Ethereum. Sure. Um... So my background's mostly technology, also a little bit of finance. And uh, as I started uh, paying more and more attention to finance, I started to get concerned about the state of geopolitics and uh, um, financial systems and the amount of debt in the system and um, reading about monetary theory and, and how uh, the average lifespan of uh, money uh, is about 70 years and uh, so we saw quantitative easing happen in Japan and uh, financial crisis, et cetera. And so I was uh, um, concerned about uh, how things were evolving. I talked to my friend Mike about that, uh, uh, went to visit him and uh, expressed my concerns. Um, and sometime a few years later, really, um, I read the white paper. I read Satoshi's white paper and I felt that uh, instead of people occupying everything, um, instead of complaining, and, and the complaining was good because there was something amiss and it was important uh, for people to recognize it and, and share that, uh, that uh, people thought that uh, um, there were problems with centralized systems and, and uh, the financial system, uh, but instead of um, just complaining about it, um, what I read in that white paper was a way of building alternative systems. Uh, and so I actually w sort of flipped from being a little bit depressed about how things were going to, to pretty excited uh, that we could actually uh, start to um, do something about uh, fixing global infrastructure. And so uh, that was early 2011. I read everything I could for quite a while. I didn't really immerse myself in the Bitcoin ecosystem other than just reading uh, absolutely everything. Um, and I, uh, both Vitalik and I are from Toronto and I was back in December 2013 visiting my family and circumstances led us to meet at a meetup and talk to him about his new project, uh, Ethereum, and uh, read the white paper describing the Ethereum platform. And uh, uh, it sounded pretty awesome. And I'd had a lot of respect uh, for this then 19-year-old already from reading a lot of his work. Uh, and so uh, right place, right time. I stayed close to the project. And a few weeks later, we all gathered in a house in Miami. And uh, um, a few of us ended up becoming uh, essentially founders uh, to try to deliver this project ar around Vitalik. Um, worked out reasonably well. Uh, a year later, uh, we were getting close to launching the platform and there weren't a lot of people building at the application layer and so I started gathering some software developers and we tried to build decentralized applications, tried to figure out what it is to build a decentralized app, uh, what it is to try to wrap a company around a decentralized application. A lot of people thought that that wasn't gonna be a viable thing, um, but I think we demonstrated to our, uh, our own level of comfort that that, that would work. Um, what we ended up having to do uh, was build things like developer tools and infrastructure that can handle up to 10 billion queries uh, from the ecosystem and, um, and essentially opening up that ecosystem uh, along with uh, a bunch of other companies in the space. That's awesome. Well, I wanted to share a little vignette on the passion that uh, Mike and Joe were talking about in this. The first uh, conference I went to, was, you know, it was only three or 400 people in the whole community. It was you know, just in some threadbare hotel in New York. And I was like, hey, it'd be great to get you know, a group together to work on the issues in the community, try and get regulators there. And so I invited about 35 people to go to my house and some houses we rented in Tahoe. 
and got all the people from the community together, including the CFTC commissioner was there, uh, like Katie Hahn, you know, who was a prosecutor at the time. So we really wanted to get, like, not just all the people drinking the same Kool-Aid, but all the people on the other side of the table there. And uh, one of the previous panelists, uh, Jesse Powell, who was, uh, he and Charlie Shrim, who were just on a panel, they were going. And the passion about the project was so intense that it, I had decided since we were all going there and then we we're going to go to Money 2020, it'd be convenient to um, charter a couple turbo props and you know, do the, all three legs together because we had 30 people all doing the same thing. And Jesse said, no, this project is so important. I don't want to have the whole Bitcoin community in a plane together. <laughs> I'm going to organize a carpool. And he sat in brutal traffic for like seven hours. And to me, that's the spirit that gets me excited every day is that we're doing something way bigger than just a trade. Like Mike and I have done a lot of trades over the years. It's been fun, but this thing is way more important, way, you know, it's going to impact billions of people's lives. Yeah, that was one of the questions that I initially had, but you already answered it, is that, um, you, I mean, in just talking now, you all mentioned some sort of disruption. You're talking about disruption, Joseph. You mentioned the middle finger to the man. <laughs> you know, um, you talked about disrupting as well. So I was wondering, you know, was it purely a financial decision for you guys to get into this? Did you know that there was going to be big money in this and you were like, ah, I want to go into this? Or were you like, I mean, it, clearly you're a lot more passionate about this. And I wonder what you think about this new wave of institutional players come in whether this sets you apart from some of those who perhaps have a different take? Well, for me, it certainly started as financial, right? And, and it's just in my blood. If I think things are going up, I buy them. If I think they're going down, I sell them. Um, but at one point, I did realize, you know, I wouldn't have come back. I had retired uh, nicely from Fortress, and I had money. I was, family office is a really nice place to be in. And running a company is a big pain in the rear. Uh, you've got HR issues. You've got business issues. You spend money. And I thought about it closely, but it felt like there's a, you know, there, there was a role to play, and I think that's important to feel like you've got a role to play in the community. Um, but as Dan said, the, there are issues that are bigger than, than, than just making money. Privacy is something that drives me insane, and we're losing our privacy day by day by day by day. I was thinking yesterday, the only feel like, place I really feel private is on my signal phone, uh, that you know, you're, you're being watched. and and how we deal with privacy, and, and can we get that genie back in the bottle or not. Um, democratization of finance, getting, you know, we've got huge income inequality everywhere in the world. Uh, can we do something about changing that tide? Uh, access to financial product, financial inclusion, and so those are three giant, you know, issues. Uh, and so, for me, I slowly morphed in to, to being not just about the money, but being about the, the movement as well. My guy on the left here, he, he was like a religious zealot, and partly because he gave his story of where he came from. Uh, and so, you know, I do think though all of us and all of you, you know, the, that enthusiasm was great. The hard work is ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And having some, you know, financial uh, acumen, having some financial resistance right? Money's not growing on trees like it was in 2016 and 17. Uh, probably is a good thing for the community, but it's a painful thing. Yeah, for sure. And I'm glad you brought up privacy. That's one of the most important issues to me. And, um, and I think that the direction we seem to be going in with blockchain is very anti-privacy. I mean, Bitcoin, to start off with, is not a tool for privacy. It's a pseudonymous tool. And you know, it's very fragile, that relationship between your pseudonymous identity and your real identity it can be broken very easily. But now we're dealing with a lot of regulation in the industry that are saying, well, you have to tie that to a real identity if you want to use onboarding you know, uh, ramps like exchanges. You have to go through KYC and IML and all of that. So let's talk a little bit about regulation and the direction we seem to be going in now and maybe talk about some of the hurdles you guys have faced um, you know, regarding regulation. Um, in particular, so, so I... Your, look, let's talk about your premise first, that uh, we're going in a, a disclosed identity direction. Um, I, I think that's very true uh, in many aspects and uh, it's also a push and pull uh, with the technology because um, there are uh, many developments in zero knowledge techniques that are, are enabling the shielding of identity, the shielding of um, the different details around transactions. And I think it's going to continue to be a push pull. I, I think it's really important for us um, as a planet to have a public permissionless infrastructure. 
Uh, I think it's important for us to, to have real privacy for many things that, uh, that we need to do. And um, uh, essentially, we need a, a maximally decentralized um, network uh, that can be that base trust layer. Um, but on top of that, we do have businesses um, and the need for uh, disclosed identity and reputation, et cetera. And so um, the, the World Wide Web architecture that we're anticipating uh, has that um, base layer um, that anybody, any organization in any country can potentially use. And some countries are going to have to wrap their head around that idea. And I, I think that's going to happen. Um, but we'll also have uh, a layer uh, that is much more regulated so that uh, uh, organizations can have sort of smart contract based infrastructure that has regulation built into it. Uh, we can have regions of blockchain systems that have um, data that is constrained within that region. There are laws um, about that. There are laws about uh, having certain computation done in a certain region, and, and that should be respected. Um, and so I, I think we'll see that sort of architecture, uh, but we still need those kinds of systems to to essentially have interoperability. And so a, a base settlement layer um, uh, will do that. Uh, you can. If you think about the internet right now, it's built with permissionless technology. You can, you can set up routers and TCP IP and computers, and that's a public permissionless infrastructure effectively. It's the companies that are built on that um, that, are, that have a footprint in different jurisdictions. Those are the things that are regulated, and so I'd like to see a, a similar architecture. Yeah, for sure. But what's difficult is, you know, again, that initial surge was such enthusiasm. And now it's a lot of nuance, and people don't like nuance. Uh, and you know, it's going to, you know, the, the zero knowledge stuff is going to be key to, but we're not going to have the utopia that everyone had hoped for. Uh, governments don't just say, I'm going away. Uh, they've got real concerns and, and some valid concerns, uh, as do regulators. Uh, and so the hard work is now working within those systems to try to create a structure where at least some parts of privacy are really preserved. I mean, I, I, I kind of laughed. We've had this huge surge of enthusiasm in the last 10 days because of China. It's like, we're going all in on blockchain. And I'm like, China is the anti-blockchain blockchain. blockchain. <laughs> um, that everything about what's happening there is for state control and uh, for the state to be able to monitor what's going on. Now, listen, China's got a long history of giving up privacy for social stability. And so that narrative plays powerfully. Um, but it's a world that scares the shit out of me. Uh, and I kind of think we have that held out there. And that should be kind of the, the inspiration and the enthusiasm for all the hard work in the rest of the world to, to build a system that doesn't end up looking like that. Yeah, yeah so I'm in, I'm in sync with that perspective on China. Um, but I do believe that uh, this new technology, this breakthrough in database technology that enables us to have automated trust, automated objective trust, uh, can enable us to collaborate much better. And, and so if you provide that to companies and consortia and the government in China, it changes the way you think about systems. So it is actually, we call it decentralized, they call it multi-centralized because they don't supposedly have a term for decentralized. But once their engineers and entrepreneurs and, and perhaps government officials start thinking in terms of new architectures, um, it's a powerful seed and it could um, like change things potentially. We'll, we'll see. Hopefully. Let's hope. For us as investors, we look at it, like Mike said, more nuanced, that there's some people that are really strident about privacy and it's all black or all white. And the reality is most people actually don't care. Google reads all your Gmail and sells that data every millisecond, right? Most people are willing to trade convenience, you know, free, all that stuff for lack of privacy. So I think there's going to be a, a scaled, you're basically going to auction privacy. Like if you really, really want incredibly private transactions, it's going to be you know, harder to use or more expensive. And then most people, when they're buying their coffee, don't really care you know, if people can track their payments.
Yeah, and you actually asked me earlier, you challenged me to put you on the spot and ask a difficult question, so maybe I, I will actually. So you, you're all in a position to move the bar barometer right now, and you mentioned quite accurately, no one cares about privacy, um, but you're all in a position, uh, position to make a difference about that. You know, I know you're investing in companies that you want to make a profit from, but perhaps you could also be supporting companies that are promoting privacy and maybe starting a, a dialogue about what's going on. Are you prepared to do things like that to change things so we don't end up in this Orwellian nightmare. Yeah, I, I, I didn't say no one cares, few care. Mm. And so there are things like Brave Browser's a great example. It's so much better than the data monopolists that they're competing with, but not that many people, there's about eight million people using it every month now, but you know, billions of people using other browsers. So when they're marketing, they don't even really talk about privacy, they just talk it's faster. Mm. And that's basically what most people care about. And you get more battery life because it's not downloading a lot of you know, malware. So um, I think it's going to be important, but just being realistic, most consumers don't really value privacy that much. It's so, it's so disappointing. <laughs> who, who here cares about privacy? Put up your hand. So you've got a, a large so we, consumer base here, but we, this is we a care a lot. We, we've made a bunch of investments in the yep. privacy space. We uh, um, co-founded, along with some major technology companies, something called the Decentralized Identity Foundation. At, uh, creates a specification describing a decentralized identity, and we uh, lead the W3C um, group on verifiable claims or, or verifiable credentials. Uh, and so that's, that's an infrastructure that enables us to control the root of our own identity um, and selectively disclose things when, when we need to. We've invested in uh, a couple of uh, zero-knowledge snark companies and uh, a browser that's uh, VPN based and uh, called Tenta. Um, a great project called Orchid is, uh, is probably one that, uh, that you're fairly close they, to. They had a great party two nights ago at least. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's, uh, that's really awesome. And sort of on that note, just talking about privacy, I want to mention Libra briefly because this is the first time I've heard Congress talk at length about how important users' privacy is. And it seems like pot calling kettle black to me <laughs> that they're so concerned, but I'm just so happy that they're talking about this, that how important you know, ownership of your own data is. Now, do you think that if Libra actually launches, this is gonna be a, 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 a terrible thing for the crypto space? Because I, the I, I think exactly the opposite. I think it's a huge positive for the crypto space. Um, right, you, you, in essence, credentialize all the work of the idea of a cryptocurrency, the idea of you know, a decentralized, or at least a distributed system on its way to maybe being a more decentralized system. You bring in huge resources uh, into the, the ecosystem. And so security companies, staking companies, uh, all, all of a sudden have potentially big clients. And so I think it gives a big jolt of energy into the space. It's, you know, listen, I watched those congressional hearings and it was embarrassing. You know, it was congressmen on their soapboxes that didn't know a lot that wanted to beat up on Facebook for, for some ver valid reasons and some non-valid reasons. Uh, very few really even understood the Libra project, uh, but it was beat up, beating up on Facebook. Uh, they missed the boat on privacy, as Congress often does. They were behind on the, on the game. And so, uh, listen, is it going to go through? I think they'll pivot. You know, I'm, I'm hoping it does. I'm guessing it's a 50-50. Mm -hmm. We'll know in the next year. Uh, but I think it's important uh, because if you want to accelerate the growth of this whole ecosystem, you know, bringing in two billion people that actually can start using crypto in some form uh, and get educated on how it works is wildly important. Uh, I would say the same thing about Telegram. Like if both those projects get, get shit canned, uh, I'm much more pessimistic. This, the horizon has to stretch way out. And businesses, you know, the reality of businesses is you raise capital, you hire people, you have people that want careers. If the GDP of our space doesn't grow, right, the, the, the employment opportunity doesn't grow, and you lose all but the zealots. And so it's wildly important that we keep getting winners or, and, and new energy into the community. Yeah. yeah. So until the hearings, I was pretty confident that Libra was going to launch. The minute Mark agreed that they wouldn't launch anywhere in the world uh, unless they had American regulatory approval. Um, I felt that uh, that killed the project. Um, I expected them to launch in some small and medium-sized nations and 
bide their time and you know, slowly creep into the rest of the world, but uh, um, it's gonna be hard for them to do that. Um, I agree with Mike that um, if a uh, Facebook-led Libra launches, that it's extremely good for the cryptocurrency space, but I feel like it's really bad for humanity. Um, I like the Libra project itself. Um, Facebook has its own issues. Facebook has been really exploitative of, of people's information and attention, and they have exposed themselves as essentially a negative externality as a weapon of mass social manipulation. And so uh, enabling Facebook to link financial transactions, financial history with what they already collect from different kinds of databases and our devices, um, uh, enabling them to have that profile. Uh, they've essentially been um, missing, in some cases, um, the, the root of the identity, and now they would KYC people, and uh, yes, they would promise not to link those um, those pieces of data until they get linked. Uh, so <laughs> promise not to. It, it's going to happen. <laughs> right. So, yeah, yeah, go ahead. The thing I'd like to share on that is that Christian Carlo, the former chairman of the CFTC, had a great line. He said Facebook's Libra and the Chinese uh, cryptocurrency are the Sputnik moment for crypto. And for the youngsters in the crowd, that's when the Soviets launched the first orbital rocket and America freaked out because we were way behind. That's basically what Libra did. Yep. Now the government's totally engaged. It's like game on for blockchain. And even the president of the United States is tweeting about Bitcoin. He's not totally on message yet, but that's a good thing that he's engaged in Bitcoin. Yeah, Pre President Xi uh, didn't just randomly decide to make his announcement uh, three days after the Zuckerberg hearings, right? That thing was strategically <laughs> placed to say game on. So let's talk about different jurisdictions uh, around the world and regulatory environments. Because you mentioned uh, just now, uh, Mike, you said you're talking about missing the boat. Um, and also, I mean, you're, you're talking about the, the battle between China and America. And there are lots of jurisdictions that are vying to be the blockchain center of the world. You've got Malta and Gibraltar and Bermuda all saying, yes, we will attract all the business. And meanwhile, America's introducing things like the bit license in New York, which just kills everything. So, I mean, is America missing the boat here because they're just, you know, laying out all of this bad regulation that isn't good for the crypto space? Or do you think that they can change? Do you think there's hope there? If you look back on 2016 and 17, regulators around the world were sleeping at the switch, right? If, if we look at the projects today, other than Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a few others, uh, most of them have been economic disasters for the retail customers that bought into them. Uh, regulators' job is to protect retail, and they did a horrific job at it. And so in some places, there's some overcorrection going on. It's probably to be expected. Um, I don't think it's going to change in the U.S. until Chairman Clayton uh, moves on from his role. I do think uh, it will march in the right direction. Um, in the long run, you need the United States uh, to be any... To, to the, to participate in any kind of global system. We're too big of a part of the global, global economy, especially in a world where all of a sudden, you know, there's gonna be almost two infrastructures, China having their own supply chain and the rest of the world are, 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 are the US. And so um, I don't think you can really think about a global uh, crypto ecosystem without having the US on board. So, yeah, so we're, we're feeling reasonably positive about uh, regulators in the United States. Uh, CFTC's been positive, constructive, largely hands-off, just uh, watching and letting things develop and have said some uh, very helpful things. Um, the IRS have said and done less helpful things. Or, um, they've introduced some uh, curious interpretations uh, in, <laughs> curious. <laughs> in terms of uh, airdrops, et cetera. I, I think that'll get worked out as, uh, um, as the debate happens in public. Um, we're pretty impressed with the SEC's understanding of our space. They, they really know what's going on, and um, it's complicated for them uh, to uh, make certain statements boldly. They're, they're trying to be, uh, I think, a little bit ambiguous, and I think they're going to get um, more and more concrete in their statements as, as they sort of chop off little pieces and. Uh, um, so they, they've sent some warning shots to try to clean up uh, um, 
what Mike has described as uh, uh, a horrific period for some retail investors. Um, but uh, we believe that they're looking for ways to uh, essentially uh, create less uncertainty for, for certain kinds of blockchain projects. Um, and uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you, President Xi. Uh, things are really on uh, with respect to U.S. government's interest in, in driving things uh, in this country. I think we also have to look at it not just in terms of like the U.S. government as if it's this single entity, because you're yeah. dealing with all these different departments who have different classifications for what crypto is. I mean, you got Mnuchin who gave that press conference and said, "It is my responsibility to protect the U.S. dollar at all costs." You know, talking yeah, trash talking Bitcoin along the way. So, I mean, are we going to see maybe a, a civil war within government as some areas are, are more likely to support it and others are saying no? This is a big threat to the U.S. dollar, which isn't it, essentially it isn't is. It always that way on lots of different issues <laughs> sure. and that's probably a good thing <laughs> probably good well absolutely I'd agree with that I mean do you think are you who do you think is going to succeed in that war are we going to have the US Treasury I mean the US Treasury last year set up a department entirely dedicated towards cracking Monero um, that to me is is terrifying because I know the amount of yeah. resources the government has and we know the NSA is working on this as well the, the thing yeah, so that politicians worry most about or the, should they worry about or not it's a different question is nuclear, you know, North Korea fu funding their nuclear project with illicit money from Bitcoin, uh, anti-money, you know, money laundering, terrorism, that, that bee got in their bonnet. And so that's where the privacy coin fear comes from. I don't think that's going away anytime soon other than through education. I mean, there was a big bust recently of a bunch of uh, child porn purveyors in South Korea that happened because they could track them through the blockchain. And so if you flip the flip the narrative to say, wait a minute, this is trackable. Uh, you know, call chain analysis or one of the other uh, security companies. And uh, it actually is a, a, a tool for law enforcement, not a, a, a hindrance. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so, so there are many in government that want to know exactly what's going on and, and uh, control the flows of value, know exactly what the source and destination of every significant amount of, of money transferred is. Uh, there are many who are um, pro-fluid capital formation and growth in the economy. Um, we have been, it's, what we're seeing now is a, a very useful dynamic of uh, essentially China and the US and they're going to strategically play off against one another and people in our ecosystem are gonna be able to hopefully strategically play with that narrative. And, and so um, we have, in discussions with regulators, uh, pointed out the fact that America won the internet, uh, and we, we won it because uh, um, there was openness, uh, there were safe harbors. Uh, and so uh, if we can frame that uh, in this country, that a drive to continued openness is going to uh, just be an overwhelmingly powerful uh, political and economic force um, that's going to be good for our ecosystem. Yeah, for sure. And I think the, the Joe's right that the CFTC has been very progressive. But the thing to keep in mind is these these laws, the statutes that set up all the agencies like the SEC are 80 years old. Mm -hmm. They're here to protect against the Great Depression. And the Supreme Court case that we're trying to decide whether these really mind-bogglingly complicated new technologies. How similar or different are they to an orange grove that William T. Howey developed in the 30s? I mean, it's pretty hard. So I have some empathy for the SEC. Yeah, do you think there's a big issue with that, trying to shoehorn this entirely new thing that was created into this existing financial and regulatory infrastructure? Yeah, I think it's a very, I would not want that task. It, it's a hard job figuring out, is Ethereum security? Maybe it used to be, but not, it's not now. And no, it's not a security. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and they've invest, invented a new concept, essentially, a new sort of quasi-legal construct of sufficiently decentralized to, to describe these systems and, and to sort of, after the fact, uh, um, decide that they are not, in fact, securities and, and can trade uh, freely. 
looking at. And then within America itself, you have competing jurisdictions as well. I mentioned the bit license earlier, but you contrast that with something like Wyoming, where people like Caitlin Long have just been trailblazers and setting up amazing uh, infrastructure and, and uh, policy that other states can follow. So do you think that, I mean, now that we have both sides of what could happen, you know, all these blockchain companies flocking to Wyoming, I think it's the second most popular place to incorporate, apart from Delaware at the moment, and, uh, and then compare that with New York, which just killed crypto, and you have a handful of people being given a bit license according to how good friends they are with, uh, with the regulators. My personal opinion there. Um, but it's no mistake that Ben Lorsky is, uh, was the creator of the bit license and then went straight onto the board of a company that was handed a bit license. Um, so, I mean, there seems to be like very different ends of the, the spectrum within America itself. Yeah. Do you have any um, uh, idea of which direction we might be going in as a country? So, it's an incredibly powerful technology. Um, it's breakthrough in database technology it enables us to essentially have this new construct, this new foundation of trust uh, for businesses, for uh, essentially society. And um, it has privacy characteristics. Um, mostly it enables us to create digital scarcity and trustworthy, uh, trustful collaboration. Um, and uh, that's a tool that society um, or different societies, different jurisdictions around the world need to have debates about uh, with respect to how they want to use that tool. Uh, and so um, it's, uh, uh, it's going to be a discussion uh, with different entities on, on different sides uh, of those issues. And uh, it has to play out over time because it's, uh, it's big and complex and subtle and Wyoming's doing a great job um, you know, staking out one poll. Uh, we're, we've done a lot of work with them uh, and uh, really proud of what's going on there. Um, and more conservative elements have to uh, um, essentially uh, put brakes on things so that uh, everybody can understand what's going on. It's going to take uh, quite a long time to assimilate uh, what this breakthrough is going to bring. Sure. But, you know, think about the IRS for a second. Like, in 2013 and in 2014, less than 100 people in the whole country uh, had Bitcoin on their tax returns. Now, I'm sure there's 100 people in this room that probably traded Bitcoin in 2013 and 2014. And so here's a new technology, and people weren't willingly paying their tax on it. And so people say, well, I don't understand the rules. I'm going to use the 10 beef, whatever that, you know, real estate shift is by sell Ethereum and by Bitcoin, it's not really like doing a transaction. I mean, that seemed to be a very specious argument. Um, and so if you believe in, in the government that people should pay taxes, because that's how we fund you know, 25, 30% of the, the GDP of the space, uh, the entity that collects tax has to figure out how to actually get people to pay their taxes, how to figure out if people are paying their taxes. and so. It's going to take time before the regulative entities, the regula reg regulatory entities, catch up to this crowd. Um, and that friction in between can be frustrating as heck, but it's very understandable. Uh, you know, when 100 people pay tax out of the whole country, you say, I don't think we're catching this. But, but some of them in this nation and in other nations like the idea of automated uh, real-time tax payments. So uh, we've actually been uh, looking at some of those systems. So uh, let's, as we're wrapping up here, I want to look to the future. I want to look at your predictions. So we've talked about some of the regulatory hurdles and uh, different competing jurisdictions and, and successes as well. So what do you see going forward in the crypto space? Um, do you see any particular area where blockchain tech has yet to blossom that we haven't seen it? Maybe uh, you could also talk about what's been most surprising and, and how that leads you to make predictions about the, the future. Let's start with you, Dan. Yeah, I would say the thing I'm most excited about is scalability. And if you think back to like 2012, 13, Bitcoin was going to change the world, and then it only did seven transactions per second, and it, it was a kind of a, a funky user experience. And then everyone was talking about, oh, scalability is coming in two years, it's coming in two years, it's coming in two years. Bloxrout's going live tomorrow. Like, it's actually happening. So I'm very excited. There's, you know, a lot of projects. Uh, that are very close to going live on scaling. And when you multiply all of them together times you know, the probability of them working, 
I think it's like 100% the blockchains will scale within months, not years. So I'll take a different view. I'll take the investor's view for a second because somebody out there probably wants to make money. Um, I think the simplest bet right now is still that Bitcoin's going to go higher. There are lots and lots of new plumbing being placed to allow more and more people access to this story that Bitcoin is a digital store of wealth. It kind of stole that lane. The only other one who has that patina of store of wealth really is Ethereum. Uh, you know, they both got in under the under the under the, the finish line with the SEC saying these guys are, are good. We're not sure who else will get through. Um, and so we see more and more ways that people are buying Bitcoin, more and more people buying in. Plus, the original reason that Joe was worried about the world is a lot worse now than it was 10 years ago, right? We've got $14 trillion of debt, you know, globally that trades at negative interest rates. You know, we have a full economy We've had, you know, basically full economy uh, employment in this country since Trump took office, but he, we had a 3%, you know, tax, tax cut, 3% of GDP tax cut. So the deficit grew 3%. To put it in perspective, the average family in America makes about $50,000. 12,000 of that is fluff. It's, it's this 3% extra deficit that we're running when the economy is good. So what's going to happen when the economy goes bad? Uh, when we finally hit the natural slowdown, uh, our deficits are going to balloon. Uh, so the macro story, right? We look around the world and we have world leaders that are either dictators, right? You know, with people that have unlimited power we usually call dictators, right? So Putin and Erdogan, and Hungary, uh, Ch China now, Xi said he's going to stay in for as long as he wants. Um, and so confidence around the collective global political system is, is at a low. And so it just fe feels like the story for Bitcoin as a digital store of value for fiat currency being debased is kind of limit up. And so I think the simplest trade right now, I, I do think I'm not bearish on all the other s stuff. When I talk to Joe about all the projects, their consulting side of their business, their SaaS side of the business is seeing, like that's the lifeblood that's gonna drive the next bull market in the rest of this stuff. But I think in the short run, it's gonna be a Bitcoin story. Yeah, so what we're excited about is maturing the technology um, to enable it to undergird financial, economic, social, and political systems globally. And um, that um, needs to proceed along a few different dimensions. It's, it's scalability, um, it's privacy and confidentiality, it's usability. Um, with respect to scalability for the Ethereum ecosystem, uh, we're, we have a, a base layer uh, in Ethereum 1, uh, but, we, but we have layer 2 technologies, state channels, um, and um, other kinds of networks. So Scale Network is uh, um, going to be launching soon, and uh, technologies like this are bringing tens and hundreds of thousands of transactions per second um, live for exchanges, for games, for other purposes. Uh, we build some of those networks and, and some of them are live already and many are going live soon. So it's happening. Um, with respect to scalability, we have Ethereum 2.0, which is coming out in phases. The first phase is going live um, probably January, February, something like that uh, of this coming year. Um, the next two major phases that turn it into a, a really viable um, second generation, or some people call it third generation uh, blockchain, uh, that's likely to happen. Uh, we've got a team uh, that's building out the, the second and third phase. They're building it on the first phase. And um, it feels to me like that's going to happen. A simple version of that will happen for, before the end of 2020. Um, we've got privacy and, and uh, confidentiality. We talked about that. Usability is happening. We're um, moving away from having people uh, need to wield these complex wallets and deal with the uh, long strings of alphanumeric digits. And so we're, we're doing progressive onboarding um, or, or progressive security, essentially, um, to enable people to just use an application. And after they put some um, investment into it in terms of attention and in terms of money, they, then they can uh, be nudged into creating or, or using more secure mechanisms. And uh, so we've it took us all a long time to learn how to use an iPhone. Uh, we don't remember how skillful the Apple computer company was in, in teaching us that, but we have to, to do the same thing. Um, and for us, it's uh, now it's about developers 
developers, developers, developers. Um, we're trying to drive to get to a million developers in the Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, if we bring in entrepreneurs and developers, they're going to build things that people care about. For sure. Well, thank you all so much for your time. It's, uh, it's amazing to have three titans on the stage at the, at the same time. So can you please give these gentlemen a round of applause? Thanks. Thanks.